Um, but first and foremost, hello, good evening, and a very warm, and it is very warm, uh, where there are a lot in a lot of places around the country, but a warm welcome to our event this evening on uh, the need for a national food strategy, our cooperation live. Uh, my name is Emma Foodie, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Assistant General Secretary for the Co-op Party. Um, and tonight, as I said, we're, we've got this event um, on uh, the National Food Strategy, and we're going to be hearing from two wonderful speakers in uh, Daniel Zeichner MP and also Kath Dalmany, who is CEO of Sustain. So a couple of just points on housekeeping to make sure that the night runs smoothly to begin with. Um, you'll notice um, that you're on mute as you've uh, joined the call. So only those who are speaking will have their sound enabled just so that we can make sure that there's no feedback, there's no noise. We're able to hear those speaking as clearly as we possibly can. If you do want to put a question to one of our speakers, if you can just raise your virtual hand and then what will happen is you'll get a little ask to unmute um, uh, message come through uh, when, it's, when it's your turn to speak at that point. And the other thing just to say is that this Zoom will be recorded. Uh, we like to make the recordings available of our cooperation live events uh, on our YouTube channel so that members who aren't able to attend on the night are able to, 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 to watch them back. And I'm sure uh, all of our speakers this evening will agree that we would love you to keep your camera on so that we can see who it is that we're talking to, but completely appreciate if you're not comfortable with that or if you don't want your pictures to appear on the recording, that's absolutely fine. Uh, feel free to, to keep your video off if, if that's what you'd rather do. Um, so a little bit of context uh, for tonight's event, first and foremost, um, you'll all be only too aware that the co-op party and the co-op movement have campaigned uh, around a food strategy for a really long time, whether that's about healthy start vouchers, whether that's about a right to food. This is an area that we have been exceptionally active in. And what we saw this week was that the government announced its long awaited food strategy, which was a response to uh, the independent food advisor, uh, Henry Dimbleby's review on our food security and our food systems. And the Dimbleby report that was initially, uh, when it was initially commissioned some time ago now, food poverty had already become a, a scandalous reality for so many people. And as we all see with the cost of living crisis as it's um, unfolding now, it's putting food, it's putting fuel, it's putting essentials so beyond the reach of far too many people. And a national food strategy which took these challenges seriously has never been more important, quite frankly. But the ambition of Henry Dumbleby's original review has simply not been translated into the government's white paper. The original recommendations, which were welcomed by a wide, broad range of food experts and charities, uh, looked at expanding the eligibility of key food schemes like free school meals and healthy start and improving the resilience of our food systems to challenges like climate change. And yet the white paper ignored so many of those recommendations. And Henry Dumbleby himself has said that the government's response is, quote, not a strategy, nor is it radical enough, and it needs to be bolder. And so inevitably, we've got to ask these questions about how seriously the government is actually taking this crisis that is threatening to envelop such, you know, so many families as inflation continues to soar. And I mentioned before, the co-op movement is stepping up to fill some of these gaps, whether it's at a national level where the co-op group is rolling out Caboodle, which is an initiative to ensure that surplus food gets to those people who need it, whether it's the work of Central England Co-op, where they've pioneered a relationship with Fair Share um, for an, a number of years now to make sure that, again, food waste is really significantly reduced. And East of England Co-op, again, has done such a lot of work on holiday hunger. And as I mentioned, the Co-op Party itself, we've got well over a thousand councillors who are banging the drum for local solutions as well to food justice. Whilst our MSPs in Scotland, they also continue to fight for a right to food um, to be enshrined in Scots law. But so where we needed a comprehensive food strategy that supported families, that supported uh, food producers and you know, our food system, um, what we've seen is something that quite frankly doesn't go far enough. And so we as a movement will obviously continue to push the government to continue to push them to go further in supporting those people who need it most. And also, of course, what our movement always does best, which is providing those practical solutions for our communities on the ground. 
Um, but that, as I said, is just a little bit of context about what's happened this week, about the journey that we've taken in, in getting here and the work that the co-op movement has done uh, already. Um, but now to hear from our fantastic speakers. So firstly, I'll come to Daniel. Uh, Daniel is uh, a Member of Parliament for Cambridge, but he's also a Shadow Minister for Food, Farming and Rural Affairs and is leading in this area. So Daniel, if I can hand over to you firstly. We certainly can. And thank you, Emma. And thank you for that excellent introduction. Look, um, friends, can I start just by saying um, apologies from Jim McMahon, the Shadow Secretary of State. Of course, he is the chair of the co-op party. He was very keen to be with you tonight. But I have to tell you, that there's a lot going on in the DEFRA and food world this week. And so I'm afraid he wasn't able to be with us. But can I also thank you for the work you've been doing on taking forward our rural review? We really appreciate that. And we'll be picking that up over the next few months. I'll be very brief because I, I think Kath and her colleagues have got a lot of detail to share with you. But we were uh, hugely disappointed, I think it's fair to say, um, like many others, with the uh, announcements on Monday. It had been long trailed, frankly, that it was being watered down. Um, I've lost track of how many times I've challenged the food minister in the Commons on when this was finally going to happen, because it was promised for many, many months ago. And they've used a variety of excuses over the months. But what's clearly been going on is a battle within government um, where those uh, slightly more progressive forces um, haven't clearly lost out big time. This was a really, really disappointing announcement. Incredibly thin, even by government white paper standards. And for those of you who have read government white papers over the years, you'll know there are ways of thinning them out. Um, you can stick nice pictures in, that kind of thing. But they were so busy still taking stuff out over the weekend that it's ended up being a very, very... Uh, basic document indeed. And of course, the thing I think that's most striking to many of us is that it makes no mention of hunger or food banks. And that uh, in the current situation seems uh, particularly extraordinary. So a whole range of things completely missing. I will say there are a couple of things which um, I'm am pleased to see in there because uh, the, the shadow team and Jim in particular have been banging on about these for some time now. Um, very much led by Rachel Rees' policy of making buying and selling more in Britain, uh, we've been pressing for much better use of public procurement. Um, so that means our local schools, hospitals and so on really ought to be um, being uh, not only told to buy local, but actually, of course, given the resources to buy local. And that's the bit which I think is missing in this plan. And some of you have seen the shocking news this week that um, for, for school meal providers, just an extra 7p being provided. Um, for providers to try and pay for the ingredients going into school meals when costs are rising hugely, of course. Um, so we welcome their aspiration. It is only an aspiration to have a consultation um, to think about reaching 50%. And this is part of the problem with, with the, 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 the things that are in here. Mostly they are consultations, plans, maybe in the future, absolutely no legislation. And of course, that's a huge um, disappointment for many people who have been expecting legislation on the back of this um, and the and no governance structure that's been talked about much less but actually if you look at one of the problems that besets this whole area um, it, it is the responsibility is, is spread across so many government departments this is a frustration for me if I want to talk about school meals I tend to have to go and talk to my colleagues in the education team if I want to talk about obesity it's people in the health team and this has I'm afraid limited action um, to successive governments, and there was the opportunity um, to think afresh here. The other area which is positive, um, which Jim in particular has been talking around about in recent months, is what's called a, a national land use framework. Now, this means different things to different people, but basically uh, it is typical of this government that there is no way of, um, of sorting out whether you should be using your best agricultural land um, to host solar panels or trees. And we're seeing arguments about this all around the country. And we basically have, have no way of resolving these issues at the moment. So it's not simple. And my guess is what they will come up with will probably um, be pretty inadequate. But at least it's a, it's a step in the right direction. And we welcome, welcome that. So as I say, some things in there which um, one can pin some hopes on. But exactly as you said in your introduction, Emma, um, the challenges that Henry did will be laid out. And they were stark. Basically, he said we have an incredibly efficient food system in narrow monetary terms, but a system that's making us ill because of the junk food cycle and is damaging the planet. Now, those are two pretty big challenges. And as I said in the Commons on Wednesday, the government 
has completely flunked them. So a lot for us to pick up and do. We have been waiting to some extent to see what the government came up with. We now know what they've come up with. It's not very good. Just a final thought. I've long said that basically the reason uh, the government doesn't have a plan is that their plan is to, for there to be no plan. In other words, to leave it to the market. That is George Eustace's view. And that explains the trade deals and all the rest of it. In, in the end, and I think it's a huge irony that Henry Dimbleby's report was entitled The Plan. Well, the government have rejected it. But as a labour movement and a cooperative movement, I think we understand the need for a plan. And that's what we're going to be working on. Thank you so much for that contribution, John, Daniel. Lots to lots to think about there, and I'm sure lots of uh, questions being generated uh, with our attendees as well. If you do have any questions, just a reminder: if you just want to pop them in the chat, um, and uh, and we'll be putting them to, to Daniel and Kath um, in a moment. Um, but yes, we will now come to Kath. Kath Dalany is uh, CEO for Sustain, as mentioned before, which is the Alliance for Better Food and Farming. There is such a lot to say about Kath that I could probably fill 15 minutes in terms of the work that she's that she has done. So I will try and keep it as brief as possible, uh, which is just to say that while she's been there, she's developed the campaign for a Better Food Britain. Um, she's the Lions lead on food and vulnerability. And also she was instrumental working with partners in launching a judicial view on the government's approach to children's holiday hunger during COVID-19. Um, so we're really excited to be joined by her to hear and hear her, her perspective um, on, on what's happened this week. But I'll hand over to Kat. Thank you so much. I agree entirely with Emma and Daniel's analysis <clears throat> and summary of what you just said. Um, it was that was so coherent. I almost feel like we've done my job. However, I can go into more of the details because that's my job. And I've just put up a link to a hub that we run of lots and lots of reactions and analysis that my colleagues, um, including Orla, who's there and has also put a link in the chat, um, have been working on to help collate the responses because the food system is very complex. There are lots of issues, as Daniel just set out. When I read the draft of the National Food Strategy and then the actual one that came out, it's not a strategy. You're right. It's not even a white paper. It's a grey paper on which, which is mainly a list of things that have already been promised, plus a couple of things that have been a bit uprated, plus land use strategy and a few other things. So we were more than disappointed and we are doing our best to look at where there may be opportunities to do some work on that. Um, the fact that a food strategy response came out with nothing about people going hungry in it leaves me angry. And I think that we need to use that anger and to a good purpose. That's what anger's for, isn't it? To turn it actually into coming out fighting. I'm not somebody who enjoys fighting, but I really do feel quite aggrieved that all of the good work that is going on across this country to try and address people's poverty and hunger, which is a terrible thing to be talking about in a in modern times and you know I've seen the map of all the food banks across the country and speak regularly with people who run such services and are really really struggling at the moment so I am deeply deeply grateful to the cooperative party for signing up to the right to food in your manifesto for the previous uh, general election I'm deeply grateful that you keep this on the agenda and for the Labour hunger campaign which keeps this on the political agenda because it is deeply political but I, what I feel, having worked in the food movement for a very long time, is that this government does not see it as their job to ensure that everyone can eat. I want to repeat that because I find it quite shocking. This government does not see it as their job to ensure that everyone can eat. It does see it as their job to intervene in energy and to make sure that everyone can heat their homes to some extent. Obviously, poverty comes into that quite extensively, but that's a regulated marketplace in which the energy companies have to help people living in poverty to access energy and they can't get cut off and they have to be helped. In food, there's no measure of income. So the benefits level, as you know, I'm, of course you know this, but the benefits do not cover the cost of eating, you know, and it isn't calculated on that basis. And minimum wage is not calculated on that basis. So people through policy end up not being able to eat. So there's nothing about wages in this food strategy. There's nothing about benefit levels in this strategy. And I watched Therese Coffey, Secretary of State for the Social Security Safety Net, saying in Parliament to a select 
community recently. It's not my job, it's DEFRA's job. She literally said that, I was horrified. She said, that's a DEFRA issue because it's food. Why? Why are we not very angry? Well, I am very angry with her for saying that. It was gobsmacking and I had to watch it four times on repeat to be sure I'd heard the right thing. So that's handing the responsibility back to DEFRA who then see it only as a food issue, not as an income issue not as a structural issue that needs to be addressed through structural purposes. So there we are, we have a food strategy that does not mention income, doesn't, well, it talks about wages, but only in the context of pushing up skills in order that wages will be dealt with by the private sector, by employers. It doesn't talk about lifting the minimum wage. It doesn't talk about benefit levels being calculated in relation to the actual cost of living. Next, he doesn't say anything about health, as Daniel quite rightly said. Now, that's weird, isn't it? Because food is mainly about our health. What we do think is that that will now be put into the health disparities. We're not allowed to say health inequalities anymore, by the way. It's health disparities these days. Anyway, we'll adopt the language if we must. So that will all be put into the health disparities white paper, which should be coming out shortly. Hopefully that paper will be white, not grey, and we'll have actual policy measures. But unfortunately, we've already seen that Boris Johnson is bowing to vested interests by backing off from obesity measures recently by saying, oh, let's not do more of the curbs on junk food marketing that we need to be doing. So we have a campaign going at the moment to try and put pressure back on to say, you promised them in legislation. We can't just kick that can down the line. We have to be doing it now because obesity is rising. People had to revert to all kinds of junk food during um, COVID. And also people who are at food banks are presented with whatever surplus is available, not actually necessarily a healthy diet. And they don't have the means to procure it, which is the point of a right to food. So what the, the few tiny scraps that are in this version of the food strategy, this element, were things like a five million pound fund for a school food revolution. Well, of course, that's only 50p per child or 50p per school child in this country. So this is just really, really scraps. So it's trying to show that it's doing something and grab a headline. I'm very glad that the media in this country realised that and actually said, what about the free school meals? Wales, Northern Ireland, Scotland are doing far better than England on free school meals at the moment. They're seeing it as a systemic approach to addressing food poverty for families who are struggling. Fantastic, why not England? In, people in England who have children are getting less support in that respect. And of course that school meal can also, as Daniel said, be healthy and be supporting farming, be uh, created in the right kind of way that supports national policy goals on climate because it's about food and how that's produced. Um, a very wise colleague of mine, Barbara Crowther, who runs our children's food campaign, said that she felt that this document, I'm not calling it a white paper nor a strategy, this document that came out on Monday looked to her a bit like an environmental response to the national food strategy analysis that Henry Dimbleby had done. So it was almost like it was mainly about the farming side and that the government had looked at it through a national food security and Ukraine lens. So it was about production, it was about support for farmers, and that side of things with a few of these scraps of school stuff thrown in to look like it was more about food system. So it also feels like this stuff is being dispersed to a number of departments. So as I said, a white paper from Department of Health and OHID, the Office for Health Improvement and Disparities, sort of that being another department, you know, pushing it back out, which plays absolutely precisely to Daniel's other point, which is where's the governance structure in this? Where's the accountability? Where's the actual, you know, in times of crisis, when food is a fundamental part of our relationship to our health and a fundamental part of our relationship to the biodiversity and climate crises, where's the governance structure? This is really serious stuff. This is, I think the government also sees food as a bit trivial and it's certainly down to, for them, down to a consumer individual choice. Climate change isn't about individual choice. Of course it isn't. The, the effects of our enormous system on people's well-being, on their health, on their mental health as well, because if you're food insecure, that's a massive part of mental well-being as well. Where's our responsibility in stepping up? Where's the accountability? Where's the legislation that puts this into place? So I don't want to be overly negative, although I am feeling that a bit this week. There are some things in there that we should be looking at. There is the opportunity to respond to a very long document on procurement 
<laughs> and we looked at it and went, oh, this is longer and in more detail than the actual strategy, the procurement consultation, but we will respond to that. Although I do feel a little bit like Groundhog Day because although they promised the notion of 50% healthy and sustainable food, I am old enough now in the food system to remember that 10 years ago, they said the same thing and it was 40% then and nobody's checked whether it's happening. So the same announcement was made under a Labour government for 40% healthy and sustainable, and now it's 50%, but there will be no monitoring of compliance. So I'm not hanging too much hope on that, but it is a great headline, well done, Boris. Um, and there's, but there is some interesting things like a promise of some kind of reporting from food businesses on their progress on health indicators. So that could be interesting. There's some, weaker promise of looking at sustainability measures and animal welfare measures as well with food businesses but that could be handed over to the food businesses to define which is very in the style of this government as well we don't want people who are going to profit from selling us more fat salt and sugar to define what looks like good so that has to be open to public scrutiny etc so each thing that looks a bit more promising we're going to have to do a lot of work to make sure that it becomes good and we've got to keep that anger about the fact that food poverty and hunger is not being addressed in any serious way by this government. It makes me feel really cross. I would love to talk more with people who can discuss ways that we might address that. And I would say that there's also a whole element on trade. So this is my last point. Food system is enormous, isn't it? This is what keeps us so busy and having so much fun the whole time. I'm not going to go into that in great detail because I do want to give people a bit of time to ask some questions, should you wish. So I'll stop there. Lovely. Thank you so much, Kath. And I think you're right. We do need to use that anger. We need to use that anger and translate it, as you say, into action so that we can see the meaningful change, which so many families, so many children so desperately need up and down this country. And as you say, it is is it is you know if so there's something to get angry about then it is then it is absolutely this um but it's it's also fascinating to hear about the work that um that your organization's been doing in this area and so as you're saying keen to 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 hear from members as to uh, any queries that or questions that they might have for daniel or kath or, or indeed myself um uh, uh, about this work about um about the, uh, the the national food strategy um i will uh, i'll ask people to, to to pop their hands up um if there's anything that they particularly want to ask um, but I do have one that's been submitted in the first case um, which is for uh, uh, Kath, uh, I'll come to you initially, which is that but basically accepting kind of that, um, that a lot of this report is 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 um, is is not good, uh, shall we say? Which uh, which we, which I think we're uh, we're all in a, in agreement here, and a lot of kind of missed opportunities there. Um, if you were to ask the government for one particular thing to be reversed, what would I suppose what would be top of your list in terms of uh, of, of, of the that the government need to take action on at this point? And then I'll also come to the to the two hands as well, and we'll do uh, questions in a in a quick round of three. And um, so that's the first one. Um, next one we've got is it is it Godfrey? Uh, Godfrey, we just need to send you a message to unmute to begin with, uh, so okay. we can hear you. There we go. We talked about what white paper being produced, Emma. Um, by what department was that produced? What department was that produced from? Uh, that was from the um, from the environment um, department. I'm just looking at Daniel and Kath for confirmation there, uh, just to make sure that I got that right. Yes, that is correct. And did you talk about a second white paper, which is might be it should be out coming soon. out from, I can see you all, if, I, if you want to nod to make sure this is right as well, which is that it's from the Department of Health and the Office for Health Improvement and Disparity, so OHID. Okay, thank you. Lovely, thank you. And uh, Andrew, if I come to you next. Yeah, well, thanks, thanks very much. And, and thanks for organising this session, because I, I think... Um, we should be very concerned about food poverty, extremely concerned. And I think a lot of people are concerned. And in, in our village, we started a scheme in the local library with food from the co-op under food share where food's made available to people. Um, and it's just a small effort. But I talked to other people through churches and other groups who are involved in food banks. And every time we discuss it, everybody says, we should not have to be doing this. This is outrageous that we're in this situation. 
Um, so my question is to both of the speakers is, how do we build on this frustration and outrage and this community outpouring of effort, which is increasing all over the country, even though it's more difficult to find the resources to run the food banks. But I think more and more people are becoming concerned and getting involved in it. But it, it needs to translate itself into a, 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 an effective movement to get this changed because it's not it's unacceptable for a country like ours. And I don't I, I want to find a way to translate that broad based frustration into something which is going to change the situation and how do we do that that's my question thank you andrew that uh, that was uh, i think a really good question in terms of uh, summarizing how, how a lot of people i think uh, feel especially on this call this evening and um, kath if i can come to you first if you're able to address the first question which was from helen sorry i forgot to say and um, which was what is the kind of top issue um, or the top mm. kind of thing which could be changed and then if you want to um um, lean into Andrew's question slightly and then Daniel if I come to you to uh, answer Andrew's question as well. Uh, I get to wave a magic wand thank you very much for the question. Um, I, politically speaking I think free school meals because it is people really get it uh, and because there's a huge momentum behind that and that slightly answer, answers Andrew's point as well is that let's look to how we've built that m momentum around free school meals but universalism relinked to that, uh, that as well. So that the notion that you get a teacher and you get books and you get pens in schools and you have a right to education, or why don't you have the right to the food there as well? So that we can start the wider conversation about this is about people's well-being. We, we start with children at Sustain, right? While we run a children's food campaign, it is about good food for everybody. But you start with children because everybody gets that children's children should be looked after and when people say nanny state you go great children have nannies no problem move on we've got to actually do this however that's one tiny part of the jigsaw puzzle so I'd also say if I get to have my magic wand work twice uh, is that we need a food bill like the is going through the Scottish Parliament at the moment it's a good food nation bill they have really won the idea that this is a rights-based agenda so building up the head of scene we could learn from Scotland about how we build that momentum up to say, to give the framework, the accountability, the ability to draw down resource, the allocation of responsibilities. That is a long game, but let's make it a 2024 general election issue. Absolutely, thank you. And uh, Daniel, if I can come to you. Yeah, I mean, look, really, really good points. And every food organisation I've ever spoken to has made the same point to me. Um, this is not about food, actually, it's about money. And that's what people actually need so that they can make their own choices. So the big thing is things like reversing the NI um, increase and so on. That is the fundamental answer of this, that we should not, absolutely, we should not have food banks. I would just say, um, in a way, this is, this is what David Cameron was trying to do uh, with his big society, to, to shift the responsibility away from the state and society onto individuals and charities. And um, I think it's wonderful that people have responded in the way they do, but they really shouldn't be having to do it. And Andrew, that's, that is your point, I think. And the answer to how we change it, well, you would expect me to say as, as, as a Labour politician, we absolutely need a change in government and a fundamentally different approach to these issues, because it is absolutely, the, I'd say, one of the, the key issues of politics, how resources are distributed, how you make sure that we do not have people who cannot afford to eat in this country. That should be one of the biggest political questions we face. And if we frame the next election in that kind of way, then it's a different question to the way the government's trying to frame it at the moment in terms of piling up hate and division within the country. I think the country would back a, a, a promise and an offer that we do not have food banks because we do not have hungry people in this country. I'd also like to add that we should look for allies in all places, because although this has become a party political issue, there, there have been people within the Conservative Party who have been supportive of the right to food. I'd, spot, I'd point to, for example, towards Robert Halfen, who's uh, chair of the Education Select Committee, who is very supportive on lots of the work around schools. So uh, we should also try to make this something, you know, obviously we're talking in a political context, but this is so fundamental to what we are as a society. We should also seek ways to look for allies in every place we can. Thank you both. Uh, that was a really comprehensive answer. Um, I'll come to uh, our next round of uh, questioners uh, now. So first and foremost, Ryan. Hello. Um, I wanted to ask, is it possible for local councils that the Cooperative Party and Labour Party control to start their own local food programmes so we can help people 
directly now rather than waiting for Tories and national government to pick up the slack? That's brilliant. Thank you very much, Ryan. Um, I can see big thumbs up there from Kath already, but uh, I'll just come to oh, Godfrey. You had your hand up a, a moment ago. Um, sorry, we're just um, asking you to, to unmute um, before we go. In Wales, we won the battle to give free school meals to all primary school children. Um, the, the next battle will be what do we do about secondary school children? And also, um, Wales during COVID um, gave free school meals or vouchers or something similar to uh, everybody who qualified during the holidays. And so that's the next battle. Uh, the present Welsh government has said that's going to be extended for one year, but there's no certainty after that. So that's the next battle. What do we do in holiday times? Thank you. And um, I've just got one message in the in the chat and then um, we'll, we'll we'll come for a second round and then that's going to have to be it, I'm afraid, because I'm, I'm conscious. I, I promised my speakers a, a, an earlier finish time than what I'm allowing. Um, so uh, if you'll forgive me whilst I take a lend a little bit further and, and Duncan, I will come to you in a moment. Um, but we've got a question from Jane in the chat just to finish this particular round, um, who's asking about whether... Um, we can work with other partners, um, whether that's uh, co-ops, both local and national, um, around um, offers to schools and around affordable and healthy food. And also um, regarding trade, is there ways to push kind of fair trade in our trade agreements um, as obviously the, the, the kind of the cheaper imports that um, that, that come with that can um, in, in, sorry, cheaper imports rather, forgive me, I'm just reading, um, can cost life chances and cause great poverty in, in, in other issues. So I suppose act effectively is, do we push that poverty somewhere else by kind of um, allowing for um, lower prices and, and kind of trade agreements, which mean that yes, we're able to access food at a, uh, at a lower rate, but does that mean that kind of it's at the expense of other areas So the need for kind of fair trade agreements in that? And um, so those are the, uh, that's the final question in that round of questions there from Jane there. Um, so I'll come to, to Daniel first this time around if you want to uh, address those and then I'll come to Kath and then we'll do the, the last round of questions. Well first of all Ryan yes absolutely and I think we're seeing brilliant work being done across the country in a number of councils in my own council in Cambridge fantastic work supporting um, local peri-urban farming feeding that um, food being grown locally into local food hubs which are being organised by, by the city council so yeah and that, that is being replicated in labour authorities around the country. Um, Godfrey on school meals, yes, you're absolutely right. And this obviously is, is a huge issue and is one of the ones that we'll be looking at um, as we come up the next election, as we as we work out what it is that we can offer um, to try and make sure that we tackle this crisis. And personally, I think um, feeding children in our schools is one of the best ways of doing that. Um, and on the trade agreements, Jane, yes, again, you're absolutely right. I hinted at it earlier. I think the overall government strategy um, is to try and import cheaper food to lower standards from other countries. That is the only conclusion you can come to looking at what they've been doing. And extraordinarily, during the, the passage of the Agriculture Act a couple of years ago, one, one particularly notorious government advisor famously asked the question, do we need to food, produce food in this country at all? Why can't we just import it from anywhere else? Well, that looks a particularly um, uh, unwise suggestion, given the way the world has gone in the last year or two, but it was unwise enough for a whole range of reasons, not least the environmental damage that it would do. So we, we want to move to move producing much more food here, particularly fruit and vegetables. Thank you. Also, just before I come to Kath, just a flag that um, we do a lot of resources in this area for uh, local government and for uh, co-op councillors if there's work that they want to do around um, having local food um, food justice champions and uh, various other kind of materials are available to, to support kind of taking this work uh, locally as well. Um, but Kath, I'll come to you. And thank you for mentioning fruit and veg, Daniel. That is a really important thing. And within this grey paper, there is a commitment to a horticulture strategy, which is very welcome. So not wanting to be overly negative, that is one of the things that we're looking to see how that could develop really well. And it links to Ryan's point about local councils. So we run an initiative called Fringe Farming, and that means the fringe of urban areas in the peri-urban fringe around cities and towns 
where good horticulture can happen that is very close to local markets and can link to biodiversity, urban greening, social enterprise, all kinds of things. And there's various local councils around the country are doing fantastic stuff around that, enabling land to be made available for horticultural production and decent jobs that are linked to markets who are needing affordable fruit and veg. Great stuff. So I'm not sure that's in the grey paper in the detail, but let's make it so that the implementation of it includes that kind of work. Because the emphasis on the, in the grey paper is on uh, sort of big venture capital investment in huge greenhouses for more cucumbers. Not necessarily bad, but that isn't necessarily what we mean by affordable fruit and veg for people on a low income and for a healthy diet. So Ryan, also, there's a lot of great work going on in local councils, as Daniel said. We run a network called Sustainable Food Places, where there's about 50 or 60 places around the country who have food strategies and uh, food partnerships. Now, those will involve the local council, voluntary sector groups, and sometimes uh, local food businesses in order to develop a strategy together and do implementation activities to do things like reaching out to people on a lower income to see what can be done that is beyond the food bank, that isn't about food aid, that is about building local resilience in food systems, about promoting healthy start and all those kind of things. So do check out Sustainable Food Places to see if there's something going on in your area in that respect. And we want to help make it that quite political to say that's there and that needs to be developed on. It is mentioned, interestingly, in the grey paper. It is mentioned in the food paper that came out that there are food partnerships around the country. Even that mention is something new because I think this has been going under the radar of government before. There are also in about 80 places we've worked with food poverty alliances and they are uh, I've, I've put that link into the chat as well. Food poverty alliances similarly are working locally on food system but they tend to focus also on cash so about whether or not there's welfare uh, payments provision in the local council and uh, whether there's things like people are being referred when they go to a food bank referred to support with debt advice with you know housing benefit advice all that kind of stuff so it's very important when people express their need by having to turn up at a food bank they don't just get food obviously the food helps it's a wonderful thing that people are supported in that moment of need but they also get the help to make sure they're getting their entitlements and you know to to stave off debt and that kind of thing so there are good things happening. It's not everywhere. I think there ought to be that this would be part of the accountability framework in legislation, a need for that. You know, in actually Wales, thank you very much for mentioning Wales, Godfrey. In Wales, there are lots of food partnerships and there's a community strategy that is encouraging that. How wonderful Wales understands that, that the value of that. So it's getting to the point where almost half of the places in Wales now have a food partnership. Scotland is going that way as well. So the idea that there is local action supported by national policy that may be able to call down resource flows to make that more resilient and sustainable is a really positive move. There are lots of places in England, but they're having to do it fairly alone in terms of national policy. So, and there, there's all sorts of things that then happen because food's got this wonderful generation of ideas and connections and friendships and positivity that happens when food is put central to place and I really support people getting involved in that because it's it's heartwarming as well about what can be done obviously you still need the money flows you still need the wages and the benefits to be flowing otherwise we're trying to fix problems that are too big for us to fix with community efforts however beautiful those things are as an expression of charity and solidarity we can't do that without the money flows Thank you. Um, we'll come on to our, our last round now. I'm sorry if you've uh, had something that you wanted to ask that you haven't had the opportunity to. If you have, just please get in touch following this and we'll do everything that we can to, to get an answer and to get in touch with panellists. Um, can I just say, I realised I didn't answer the trade thing, so perhaps we pick that up in this round. Absolutely. No problem. Thank you. Uh, Duncan? We'll just get a quick thing to uh, ask you to unmute. Um, I was just going to say that there's a lot happening and there's hunger and there's a contradiction between these two things. There needs to be a national strategy and the government is doing its utmost to evade that. The only way in which we can get a national strategy is not getting distracted over issues to do with health or any other aspect of food, but an integrated ecological 
approach from central government, which will concern not just farms, but the fringe farms that I'm involved with because I run a, um, a local food cooperative. Um, surely that should be the emphasis from our MPs and from a future government and for a future government. Thank you so much. Uh, our panelists are going to have to shoot off in a moment, so if I can ask you to be so quick, Chris. Hi everyone. So I have a couple of questions actually, uh, mostly related to each other. Uh, my internet was uh, poor, so apologies if this has been asked before. Um, my question is around the fact that this um, cost of living crisis is likely to last for some time and that also impacts food. So I'm just wondering if the panelists here have any thoughts around uh, what, what is the strategy for us in terms of national food uh, policy to overcome the inflation that is uh, biting as well. And second is around um, international aid that is also uh, in line with our policy consultation. So what is the strategy in terms of our international aid? Because um, higher food prices in the UK and other parts of the world might, might also cause uh, for poverty elsewhere. Thank you. Thank you so much. And that was quick. Tony, can you be even quicker? <laughs> Sorry to be so cheeky. If we can uh, get you off mute. Tony? Yeah, hello. Um, yeah, a number of points that come to mind. I was particularly interested in the idea of um, what was referred to as fringe farming setting up uh, maybe growing units on the outskirts of towns and cities calls to mind the project in Cuba where we could learn from where um, through a, you know as a result of their impoverishment through the American economic blockade and following the collapse of the Eastern Bloc they were forced to become uh, as self-sufficient as possible and I visited there um, quite a few years ago now in 2009 and visited these units so they called them organoponicos where they produce organic growing units within their towns and cities to supply the local population that's as uh, one point if I following on from that um, years ago we had cooperative uh, horticultural units in particular I'm thinking uh, probably most of the people at this meeting will be too young to remember it but there was a scheme called the Land Settlement Association, which originally was set up in the 30s to um, settle unemployed miners and other people from the north. And there was a number of these estates all around the country where they um, had a cooperative system of um, buying and marketing. And akin to that was the um, county council smallholding scheme. So you had uh, local units of um, production uh, this, you know, these two projects are, are two examples, really, of the things that um, collapsed under this uh, evil system of uh, neoliberalism that started with Thatcher and uh, unfortunately was allowed to continue when Labour came into office in uh, in '97. And both these schemes, you know, were wound up and sold off. Now that's something I think we uh, certainly as a cooperative movement we need to be pushing for again. And the other point I was I wanted to quickly make was the um, the fact that it was mentioned people were questioning why we uh, the, why there was a need for food banks you know and these existed long before the obviously long before the the current food crisis now of course the reason for this is I I think many people will will realise is that there's been this an enormous shift of wealth from the bottom to the top of you know, big corporations, rich individuals have grown enormously rich while the uh, the wage levels have been kept far too low. Uh, you know, everyone should be able to earn enough in wages or if necessary, receive enough in benefits to be able to feed themselves. So, you know, there lies the need for the, uh, the reason for the need for food banks. And currently, we as a, a party, we need to um, show our weight behind the people that are in, in industrial disputes, fighting for higher wages and, and, and so forth, because th this is the actual key to it. You know, it started with all the anti-trade union legislation that was brought in by the evil Thatcher government and never repealed when Labour came into office. To Labour's credit, we did bring in the um, national minimum wage, which built in some sort of 
uh, safeguards, but we haven't gone anything like far enough to re to to address this problem. Thanks, Thanks. Tony. I'm so sorry. I'm going to have to cut in just because I know that I'm making Daniel late already. So I would just like to give him a really quick opportunity to reply to any of the points that have already been made. Then I'll come to Kath and we'll wrap up. Thank you for your patience. Thank you, Tony, and thank you, Daniel. <laughs> Thanks, really sorry, I'm, I'm due in another meeting, so we'll have to go, but um, look, all very, very good points, and, and Tony, you're absolutely right, um, the, the county farms issue is one that's very dear to my heart, and is something that we'll be looking um, to uh, strengthen in future. Um, I think uh, something that I think where we can look at is the agricultural support in the past has been only um, made available for holdings of more than five hectares, and that's something the government, um, the Tory government, could have Done something about in the past the land workers alliance are very strong on this and i think there's there's a lot that we could do if we um, moved away from that kind of support system and supported much smaller enterprises and that goes back really to to duncan's point as well because i think that is the way we we will help create a strong local food system and finally to chris i'd go back to my point earlier that some of this is about changing the welfare system in the end the answer to this in a lot of cases is making sure people have got money in their pockets and that's really, really important. I'm going to have to go. So sorry. I um, hope to see you again all soon. <laughs> Loved it tonight. Really brilliant. Um, and very good to see you, Kath. I'm sure we'll be meeting up very, very soon. Lovely to Take see care. you, Daniel. Cheers. Thank you so Thanks. much, Daniel. Thank Bye. you. Thank you. Uh, Kath, can I come to you to, to respond to those Yes, and questions? don't worry, I don't have to rush to a meeting. What I have to rush to afterwards is to make tea for my seven-year-old. So, and she's not... Uh, she's not worrying just yet. So uh, there's quite a few things that have been raised. I'll try and do them in a sen sensible way. I, Duncan, I agree with you that an integrated ecological approach is fundamental. It's fundamental to all of this. We are obviously in the midst of a climate and nature emergency, whilst in the midst of a Ukrainian war, whilst in the midst of a cost of living crisis. All of these things have at their root, I think, getting the, the food and energy system sorted out and making sure that that is serving the needs of a, an ecological future and a fair future and decent. What's, what's wonderful in food is that they are also linked to human health because it is about good food produced well uh, and, and then also, which is not necessarily a, you know, a, something we've talked about yet, but also the balance of what foods we eat in terms of whether it comes from animals and plants because animals have an enormous impact on the planet and on carbon emissions so we can get we're not going to get into that right now so but i i absolutely welcome the notion of the integrated ecological approach is important i've put a link in because a few people have said that they're keen on the fringe farming thing a link into our initiative on fringe farming as i say several local councils really interested in that land some of it is about uh, spaces like golf courses being used being put into production some of it is about county farms some of it is about areas of land which can be made you know, partially available for horticulture and partially available for recreational use. And it's really wonderful to see that working and to help overcome the barriers to that happening and provide decent jobs in really good food production. And it's also fruit and veg, so it looks into the ecological side because it's about the plant animal balance as well. Uh, Chris, you mentioned international aid. This is something that's really keeping me awake at the moment. It so happens uh, that I'm hosting at the moment a uh, wonderful Ukrainian couple, who's one of whom's father is an arable farmer in Ukraine and is well aware that if he, he can't get in to um, you know, bring his crops in, that will be causing famine in Yemen. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's a terrible thing that's happening at the moment in terms of grain. What also haunts me is that we feed an awful lot of grain in this world to cars and to co-firing for energy and into animals, which is a very inefficient way of dealing with grain. Uh, my colleague, uh, Tristram Stewart, who people may know, has reminded me that there used to be a law in the UK and in other countries in Europe, long time ago, hundreds of years ago, saying you can't feed grain to animals. Well, it seems to me we shouldn't be feeding grain in any form to cars because it's about food, food first. Absolutely, because that's about our human future. So I think there's some revolutionary ways of thinking that we must be thinking that we should not be using certain types of biofuel for cars. You know, we've got to think in a different way about that because it's taking uh, feedstock out and feeding it to animals is so inefficient. It's really, really quite dreadful. So let's not go into that in too much detail because it's a huge issue, but I think that there are, there are fundamentals that we need to be looking at there. And 
I do want to just talk about the trade very, um, because there was a question earlier about trade, international trade agreements. You're quite right, whoever said it, food is gigantic. It covers so much. I apologize for going into all of this in such you know, a light way, but I, the links to our website can take you into the detail where our specialists work on it. At the moment, trade deals are being rushed through with pitiful scrutiny. There has been uh, a, a committee looking at how trade deals should be scrutinized, but it doesn't have any teeth and there isn't going to be much scrutiny. In fact, that the process is being launched at the moment on the Australian trade deal. My colleague Orla, who's on this call, is about to do a blog about it to try and you know, bring out the details of why this is so concerning. And it's on all sorts of stuff about, I mean, the headlines tend to be about animal welfare, but what about things like antibiotic use? What about things like fair trade? What about things like deforestation? What about things like water use in the food supply chain? You know, are we exporting our environmental footprint into the food, our social impact into the food system in countries where money needs trade's a good thing in that respect, when it needs to flow with values, so we're not supporting bad supply chains that are doing damage, and it's damage we can't see happening. What about sustainable fish? You know, th these are fundamentals, again, that need to be looked at. We have had some success with talking to a couple of the trade negotiators who are working within BASE, the, the business department, to talk to them about some of the, the detail, like what actual uh, standards they should be setting for pesticides, for example. Some countries use pesticides we've banned long ago under our European membership, European Union membership. But we've had not much success yet with talking to government about the antibiotics use. Some countries still allow antibiotics to be used for growth promoters. We banned that years ago. And it's, it makes production of animals cheaper if you put pump them full of antibiotics. But it's terrible in terms of antibiotic stewardship. It's the path to antimicrobial resistance, which it could kill more people than cancer within the next 30 years. So there are some fundamentals in there, and I very much fear that the ideology of saying we must get through trade agreements by any means possible will prevent sensible scrutiny, sensible challenge to some of those details. So we do work with a lot of the people who are the specialists who raise those details, like Pesticides Action Network, like the Alliance to Save Our Antibiotics. But it's very, very hard to get those voices to be heard and for it to become a political issue. Because as Jacob Rees-Mogg has very famously recently said, if it's good enough in India, it's good enough for us. Now, I don't want to be anti-India in any respect, but actually uh, India's antibiotic use is not good. So we should be saying things. We should actually be helping India to develop good antibiotic policy because it affects everybody. Antimicrobial resistance doesn't care about country boundaries. This is something we should all be concerned about. Thank you so much, Kath, and thank you for everyone's questions this evening as well. It's clear coming back to that earlier point as to, you know, we are angry. This is something that we want to, to take forward as a campaign. This is something that all of us regard actually as an issue of, of basic decency. This is, you know, going back to um, to, to what was said um, about kind of the campaigning and the, and the points that we need to make around that. Uh, I think it was Andrew who mentioned it. Um, then I think that, you know, the, the arguments that have been made today have been really strong in that sense. A couple of things which I did just want to flag from a um, co-op party perspective is um, a, a couple of things have come up, sorry, in the, um, in the message Message feed which just links to some of our materials whether it's for local councillors whether it's for finding um local local justice uh, champions and work that can be done locally and um, links to sharers and petitions and you know model articles um that you can send to your local paper or um emails and letters that you can send to your mps and i know that CAF has obviously shared a wealth of resources in there as well and um, so there's so much that we can get on with there's so much that we can uh, take forward to make sure that this issue continues to stay on the agenda but also that the co-op movement and the co-op party are continuing to provide those practical solutions for communities in the meantime um, so, and whilst we can try to campaign for something on a national level as well but just to say a huge thank you to our speakers this evening to Kath and to Daniel a huge thank you to you all for uh, spending your evening with us I know as I said that it is pretty warm and sunny in lots of parts of the country and the garden must have looked very appealing uh, rather than necessarily coming to, to sit in front of your, your computer screen so just to say a huge thank you and uh, and, and, and have a good evening. Thank you now. Bye-bye.